Thank you very much for joining us on the Voice of Job Seekers uh, podcast. We we're also recording a video. We we're, we're trying to do it live, but here we go. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I'm Mark Anthony Dyson. If you want to know more about me, you can go to voiceofjobseekers.com and enjoy the blog, the podcast, all the videos and all that kind of stuff. I just want to be sure that we were trying to get on LinkedIn Live and wouldn't let me be great today. So we're moving on. Lori Ruderman is with me today. Uh, she is one of the voices that you hear very loudly everywhere you are. Uh, not volume loud, but because she offers such great information, has a great perspective on HR. Uh, she's a consultant advisor to CEOs, CFOs, and CHROs who want to fix work. She's the author of the book, Betting on You, How to Put Yourself First and Finally Take Control of Your Career. We are talking exclusively about her new book, which is now out. Thank you very much, Lori, for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for that really generous introduction. And whether we're on LinkedIn Live or not, who cares? The conversation's going to be fun. That's right. Absolutely. Um, we are uh, in a mist. Um, I don't want to have to say the old cliches. We're in a mist of a pandemic still. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so um, in my view, um, the COVID pandemic didn't necessarily change the way it worked. I guess for me, it kind of exposed all the reasons why we're not where we should be with work. Um, would you agree with that or no? Sure. I think that's really well said. You know, COVID didn't just create broken systems. COVID didn't just create managers who are disrespectful and abusive. COVID didn't create mm -hmm. burnout, but it definitely shone a light on what was happening in the marketplace. And so mm -hmm. I guess my question would be, what's next? And, you know, I have some ideas on that. A lot of really smart HR and recruiting leaders have ideas on what's next. Mm -hmm. But um, here's what I know. The status quo is no longer tenable. We can't go back to living like it's 2019. I'm not surviving a pandemic just to do things the same way I did them a year and a half ago. So that's how I feel about the world of work. And that's why I'm excited to talk to you about it today. Yes. And for me, I, I focus mostly on job search. Of course, mm -hmm. the workplace uh, affects, uh, affects my lane as well. Um, it's sort of uh, like how... Uh, I guess we see all the disruption and people fighting back. It's a big thing with the teachers union here in Chicago. And you're familiar with Chicago. You've been here before. I'm and born and raised. They're... Come on, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, right. Uh, you know, the teachers are fighting back, saying, no, we can't go back the way business used to be. Yeah. After all, people were told, and rightfully so, that you can't have something because it's not possible. Now you can't say that anymore because we're here. And so, of course, there's all this pushback about how this is the way it should be, even though people really want to go. It's, it's always that way with some yeah. kind of process, right? Well, I think the interesting thing that's going to happen is people have learned that they can live on less. That's what COVID mm -hmm. has taught them. They can live on less money for many of them, but also less social interaction, less dependency on an employer because the employer let them down anyway. So there's right. going to be a real interesting push with talent, whether it's teachers or essential workers who work in retail and hospitals or even corporate professionals. They're going to start to say, how did you treat people during the pandemic? And if you don't have a real good answer... They're not going to come work for you. And they may even opt out of the system because they would rather live on less than have what you're going to give them, which is hassle, heartache, mm -hmm. a lot of bureaucracy. I mean, who wants that? Again, we're trying to live a better life than we lived before the pandemic. And my heart is with those teachers. My sister-in-law is a teacher in the Chicago public school system. In fact, mm -hmm. several of my relatives are. And- mm -hmm whether it's teachers or people who work at the grocery store, or, you know, essential government workers, they're going to have a choice and they're not going to choose to be, you know, constrained in these jobs anymore. So I think the future is going to look pretty interesting. What do you, what do you think? 
I think the uh, the future will as well, um, as especially as it affects uh, everybody, especially as it affects people who are told you don't have much of a choice. And I think part of the theme of your book, uh, the underlying theme is control your career by making more choices for yourself. That's right. You know, you may not have choices. And that's true. There are some people in this world who have to do certain things because right. they've lived a certain life, they've made commitments, they just do what it takes. But you can make choices about your time, your attention and your attitude. You know, I was the first person in my family to go to college. And I graduated with a buttload of debt. Like it's just unheard of how much debt Join I the have. Club. <laughs> Join yeah, the club, right? right. And you're like, well, okay, I'm a person with a work ethic. I'm a person who believes in paying back what I borrowed. I'm going to do that. And because mm -hmm. I had that ethic and because you cannot default on student loans, I worked in the world of recruiting and human resources until I paid off that debt. But mm -hmm. it didn't mean that I needed to be miserable. And believe me, I was not a good fit for that job. I didn't enjoy mm -hmm. it. I didn't believe in it. I didn't like the way recruiting departments were set up and HR departments were ethically run but I did the best I could in the system I had. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way from doing it right and doing it wrong. And that's what I put in my book, Betting on You. I think if you invest in self-leadership, you take individual accountability for your day, you also invest in your well-being and make sure you're taking care of your body, mind, and spirit. You're always learning something new and you're taking good risks. Those are the four underpinnings on living a good life. And if you live a good life, you can really endure those jobs that are suboptimal. I don't know. That's what I think. Yeah. And, and I would tend to agree with you uh, being that uh, people are, um, they do have choices. Uh, they do want to make the right choice for their life. Many sure. of them don't know where to run or have somebody that models that for them more than likely. You know yeah. how we, we, we live life like we travel in flocks. You know, yes. we, we travel around people who are a lot like us. Yes. And as soon as somebody flies out of the flock, sometimes that may be all it takes, but some people need two or three people to fly yeah. away and those get say, Hey, their route is a little bit better than mine. That's really well said. That's why, you know, I think in my life, I had a couple of those people. And once I mm -hmm. started paying attention to them, and I write about this in my book, I asked mm -hmm. them, how is it that you live such a good life? How mm -hmm. is it that you can put up with this cruddy job or you could have that debt, but yet you still are happy? And once I started to understand that some people had some professional distance with their jobs, I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. I'm not going to work 80 hours a week. I'm going to try working less and dare them to fire me, see if that makes a difference. And it turns out people who are most effective in their jobs aren't the ones who are giving their body, mind, and soul to the job. They use something called professional detachment. They treat their job like a client. And the less emotionally invested they are in the work, the better off they do. So I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. that's science. I'm going to I'm going to try that and not think of my identity as solely the thing I do for a living. And it turns out I was better at the job once I started to, to do that. So if there's one or two people in your life who are just killing it, chances are they're not killing it. You should ask them about it, <laughs> but then dig a little bit deeper and say, what are your secrets? What are you doing? And have a, a real heart to heart conversation about that. But I love your flock analogy. It's so good. Well, you know, um, it's something you mentioned that made me think about a chapter in your book where you mentioned how um, you were in Chicago and you would uh, work in an HR job in leadership. Yeah. And you said that um, uh, it didn't matter what you do, as long as you weren't getting sued, people were all right with you standing in line, getting a Mario Andretti autograph. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, um, I had this job that was actually pretty cushy and everything was running really well. And I didn't mm -hmm. have a lot to do. I was doing a lot of fake work. And I'm like, you know what? Forget this. I'm going to go see what the city has to offer. Who's going to really miss me? And it turned out nobody, you know, as long as I was accountable, nobody was suing the our HR department, things were all mm -hmm. right. So I spent a lot of time at the Museum of Contemporary Art, at the Art Institute. And I was walking down by Daly Plaza and Mario Andretti was out there with his race car and there was mm -hmm. a line and just, cause I'm a human, I'm like, I'm going to see what this line is all about. And I went and got his autograph, but I didn't know who he was. And my husband's like, 
you need to get a new job. And maybe I needed a new job, but I also just needed to be doing something with my brain. And so that's right. when I decided to go pursue certifications in HR. I went and got my SPHR because I had time. And as I learned about human resources and I went and got my heirs recruiting and I did all of that stuff, turns mm-hmm. out I realized I kind of like this world. It could be better, yeah. but it's interesting. People are interesting. Work is interesting. So I'm, I'm glad I went and got that certification, but... Um, I'm still not quite sure I know who Mario Andretti is. He drives a race car. At least he did yeah. 20 years ago. He did 20 years know, ago. Yeah. 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 That was about, um, it was interesting. I was sticking back to a company I was working with and we were at a conference and they had a race driver there. Uh, I think it was Mario Andretti. I don't know if it was the same time, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what made me, made me think back, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, uh, the movie that sends you back in time and don't look at anything modern because that will bring you back to where you once were. That's right. But, that's uh, right. <laughs> he must've been on the circuit or something at that time yeah yeah yeah, probably it was after 9-11 yeah I know I still don't get race car driving even though I used to go to a bunch of them when I was when I lived in Tampa Florida oh yeah that's like you have to when you live in Tampa right yeah yeah, uh, amongst other things but we won't go down that road right now (laughs) (laughs) but uh, so so therefore therefore with COVID and remote work and I think there's Mm -hmm. a lot of things that people are just concerned about they are now people are used to being safe and um i don't it's funny because you know when we have a pandemic we also have economic downturn or a wave uh because things get good then they get bad then they become indifferent uh people aren't ready people uh human behavior for the most part they take a long time to make a decision to make a change but unfortunately many of them will wait till they get burned or slightly seared to realize that that the future isn't for them because of how safe they are now, not because not because of the because how they enjoy work. Well, I think that's really well said. You know, um, people are scared, and when you're scared, you don't often make the best decisions. And so, mm-hmm. in the book, I talk about making little baby decisions, almost doing mm-hmm. experiments, you know, and testing it out in the small moments and getting good with taking a risk. And then trying it at the big leagues when it matters. You know, Mm -hmm. nobody believes in going into your boss's office and saying, I want a 6% or an 8% increase, or you could take this job and shove it. I don't know, a 10%, whatever your magic number is, right? Right, No one advocates that. But you can start to get a little bit brave and advocate for yourself. Maybe when someone is bothering you at work or asking you to do a meeting when you're busy and you would normally want to please them, but it comes Mm -hmm. at the expense of your own well-being. Try right. saying no when the risk is low or look for a job and then write down all the ways you might fail at that job or even fail at that interview and start to work on that before you actually get that job or get that interview. You know, a lot of people right. blow it in the interview because they're sweaty or they don't tell good stories or they make poor eye contact. Mm-hmm. All of that is fixable. But don't wait yeah. until you're actually in the moment to work on that. Work on it beforehand in the small, quiet moments and get good practice. I mean, nobody does anything the first time 100%. It does not happen that way. So be like the pros out there who all have imposter syndrome, by the way, and fears. Practice in the small moments. That's my mm-hmm. advice during a pandemic. And if you are in a job in a pandemic you don't like, start to peel it back. And look around a little bit, but keep that job. You don't have to quit a job you hate. You just have to like attach to it a little bit less. But you're right, my friend, a pandemic pushes us into all sorts of weird behaviors. And it's time to really be the CEO of our own lives. Right. Um, You know, I think you believe as well as I believe that, you know, you have to be an an incessant learner. Uh, oh, these yeah. days and to navigate all these different changes. And, and I go by the mantra of that job search is a lifestyle. Now you can't afford to take your eyes off the ball to improve or make even small improvements because once you do, you get caught by things that we've done uh, and that we've learned in the past year that if you can't, the, the quicker you're able to make a pivot and make the decision to pivot, uh, you can keep a seamless line of uh, possibilities open, whether it be a job or 
speaking opportunity or training opportunity, whatever it may be. But yeah. I think now that now has to become part of our lives, not just something we do when we see a crisis. Smart, Mark, super smart. And, you know, a lot of people say it's exhausting to always be looking. And it is. It's always exhausting to always be looking. But you could yeah. always be found. That's the other right. alternative, right? Put yourself in a position, Absolutely. which is what you teach, what you advocate to make sure that mm -hmm. you're learning, you're growing, and that you're well positioned, that your brand is out there so that if there's an opportunity and a really smart recruiter, they know where to look. You can't help but be found because you're so good at what you do. Yeah. And that's the difference between 2001 and 2020, uh, 2021 is that 2001, you were the hunter and it was okay to fill out a hundred job applications because yeah. you're bound to get a hit. Yeah. These days it's a, a lesson in futility. <laughs> it, yeah. is, it is better to be found or at least to be findable, to be visible. Uh, sure. And that's the difference between uh, the the old way we thought about careers and job search to the new year, to the new years and new year of uh, career and job search that now people can find you be ready to be found. So smart. But how many of us just kind of sit at our computers, maybe in a basement or sit on our phones and just scroll through job listings all day long instead of doing the really good things we could do to work on our career. You know, so much of learning right. is focused on the job we're doing today. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to hire you to do the job you're doing today. I'm going to hire you for the things you're going to bring me tomorrow. So you as a job seeker need to think, okay, what can I be learning today that's going to benefit a company in a couple of years that they're going to want me for, that I can mm -hmm. put on my LinkedIn profile, that can make me look smart, savvy, creative, innovative, all the buzzwords. And mm -hmm. I don't know what those answers are, you know, but I know that um, you can find it anywhere on the internet because this is the golden age of learning learning mm -hmm. for the most part is free. And if it's not free, it's pretty close to free. What's expensive are certifications and degrees. But if you want to learn something, there's some free hack out there to help you learn it. So it's really on you to think about what's next in your career and to go do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. As your book uh, theme is betting on you. Uh, <laughs> if you are, if you are betting that you're getting, you just want to be hired for today, it's called contract. Yes. <laughs> you know, they're only going to, they're only going to want you for that skill you hold right now. And believe it or not, that's not going to be something that's going to be equitable down the line, unless you're moving along with the trends uh, that are going along with that particular skill in that particular industry. Mark, do you find that some people are okay with that, though? They're okay with being contract? Like my dad was fine with that. You know, he was just like, give me the thing I need to do today. But that's because he really didn't have a plan for tomorrow. He was just kind of living in the day. But I think yeah. some people do have plans. Like, they love their hobbies. They love their lives outside of work. And I admire that, but that's not for everybody, that contract life. And um, right. I think if you want to be a full-time employee with benefits, you got to focus on your learning. I don't know. What do you think about and that? That The difference is, is the as you stated, and you've referred to as the 1099 employee, oh. uh, which is contract, uh, you don't get the benefits but people think that they can have both at the same time. And I think that day, there's a day of reckoning that will come um, based on some information we've had a few years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. Stating that 20% of our workforce is going, and they, uh, DeVry University had the career advisory board at that particular time. And they said specifically, 2020 was the year 20% of the workforce was going to be remote. But yet there'll be 1099 employees uh, different. that that's different now it's okay to make those decisions but you, you understand you can't you can't eat your cake and have it too no you're right. going to you're going to have to choose and i think a lot of us are going to be forced into that uh reality is that we no longer yeah you'll get paid you'll even get paid more than you did you won't get paid you'll just get paid for however however useful you are for that particular time That's and right. thus That's the right. contract work and it's brutal because you know a lot of people who've never had experiences with running a business essentially are running a business of one and yes. they have to learn like me when i went out on my own I'm like how come people aren't knocking on my door to hire me 
Well, Mm -hmm. because I got to position myself differently. And then also, oh, I have to withhold my taxes. Like I have to do this on my own and Mm -hmm. I have to buy my own office supplies and I have to buy an office chair. Nobody's going to give this stuff to me. And it was (laughs) a real lesson in the underreported costs of being in business. And I was a 1099 when I launched my career as a writer and a speaker and a consultant. And now Mm -hmm. I'm an S Corp. And what I've had to learn in the past decade between like LLC, S Corp, business entities, what's more financially advantageous. I mean, it's a whole different world being out on your Mm -hmm. own. And on top of that, I am responsible for my own learning and development. So you're right, Mark. I mean, it is complex out there. And, you know, I always thought, oh, these consultants, they look like they have such good lives and they do, but it's definitely a different way of living. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you, you got to be prepared for that, but you can't detach yourself from uh, moving forward, no matter how fast or how slow you decide to, yeah. um, that the, that if you're not moving forward, you may not be a viable commodity. I mean, just think if you're forward thinking and if you are working contract and you're increasing skills uh, that are marketable and useful for the market, whatever that market may be, you're mm-hmm. going to also have more opportunities attached to it. And that if you're visible, you could be found for those opportunities. In fact, it's great to where you get to the point to where someone steals you from another opportunity yeah. because they find you. I know we're talking about dream for a lot of people. It is happening though. Yeah, it is something that's taking place that people are are getting uh, pruned and picked, uh, poached, whatever the term you want to be want to use, is that that person's made themselves, uh, um, you know, useful uh, throughout time. So I think that's uh, right, and it goes back to what you talked about before: always be found. Whether you're a 1099 or full time employee, always make sure that people know how to connect with you if you're talented, and you do that by investing in your learning and also investing in a good social presence. It doesn't have to be obnoxious. It doesn't have mm-hmm. to be, you know, uh, young and immature. You don't have to tell me what you had for breakfast. Although I don't know, I'm kind of curious. I want to know what you had for breakfast, but I feel like a good social profile that's just mature and professional and it doesn't have to be touched every day does you so much service in the marketplace. So um, I hope people focus on that in 2021. They're learning in their brand. Sure. Now you talk about in your book, the risk management tool for predicting career failure and fixing it. Yeah. Um, Is social one of them? Well, sure. Social could be that. I mean, I am referring to a very specific tool called the pre-mortem, but anything out there to really help you understand who you are and where you want to go and to do it quickly and with minimal mistakes is a perfect tool. So we can talk about social. We could talk about the pre-mortem. You tell me where you want to go. The pre-mortem. Let's talk about that. Everybody's heard me talk about socials before. (laughs) Pre-mortem is is something is a little bit new. Let's go for it. Well, it's, it's just a philosophy. It's an old stoic tool that Mm -hmm. these old philosophers used to use. Right. And there's all sorts of complexities with that. That has been adopted for like NASA and IBM and Cisco. And it's a way to see what you want to do and to avoid failure. And so I kind of alluded to it earlier in the conversation, but let's say you want a promotion at your job or you want to look for your next job. What I would like you to do is do what, um, you know, an engineering firm would do if they were building a bridge, predict how it's going to go wrong, predict how that bridge is going to go into the water and avoid Mm -hmm. failure. So what you do is you set the timer for 60 seconds if you're at home and you you think, okay, I want to apply for a new job. I want that job as a director. How is this going to go wrong? How am I going to blow it? And for Mm -hmm. 60 seconds, you write down all the ways you're going to blow it. Well, I may talk too much. I might not be the best advocate. I may be terrible at telling stories. I may not actually be ready for it yet. And you just list all the silly, irreverent, and realistic reasons why you're going to blow this. And when the Mm -hmm. timer goes up, you have to stop because you could do this for hours, right? And -hmm. then you look at that list and you start to fix the ones within your control. And if you do that, you improve your chance of success by over 
30%. And that's not just me, that's risk management and project management techniques, research and science. So if you apply this way of de-risking what you're about to do, just like a corporation would do, you put mm -hmm. yourself at a greater chance of success, of getting that promotion, of getting that job, of getting whatever it is you want. Stop failing in the same ways you always fail Give yourself permission to just get rid of all the bad stuff that you know of mm -hmm. and maybe, I don't know, maybe fail in a new way. I'm not sure, <laughs> but certainly stop making the same mistakes over and over again. That's what the pre-mortem is all about. And just, I love it. I, as a management technique, it's so smart. Right. Now, is there a good, great site to find this particular tool that people can go to? So actually, um, based on all of this, uh, so yes, you could do research out there, just Google pre-mortem and these uh -huh. tools exist. I tried to build it once before as software and that mm -hmm. failed. Oh. Nobody wanted to, people want it as like a coaching technique. They don't want it as a software offering. So there's tons of research out there, tons of information about the pre-mortem, but nobody has built this thing that's an app. Mm -hmm. But I might do it again. I still love it. I love it so much. I'm like, maybe I'll take another bite of that apple. It sounds interesting, but I think people can do that in theory. Um, I think there was a word that we used to call anticipation. Uh huh. And that's it's right. A, a little, a little bit different than what Carly Simon used to talk about in making me wait. <laughs> uh, but, but ultimately, you're talking about looking at the pros and cons and going down a road in your mind or yeah. in a virtual kind of way yeah. and seeing the good and bad and to see if you're willing not to, if you can avoid the bad, that's great, but can you endure it perhaps? That's right. Can you face it? Because all of us know that, and there are 10 ways that projects fail, projects, initiatives fail over and over again. It's based on like team, your team cohesion is bad, or you don't have the right people supporting you, or you haven't dedicated enough time to the thing that you want to do. And you're trying to do it, but you haven't really prepared yourself. You're not quite ready for it. Or mm -hmm. um, sometimes politics gets in the way, like with a promotion yeah. or right. with a project or a job offer. So there are all these universal points of failure that happen over and over again. All you have to do is think back to the last time you did something. And a lot of people do that. They do a post-mortem and they go, why did this fail? But you know what most people do with a post-mortem? They forget about it. They mm -hmm. just go, oh, I don't want to think about the negativity again. In fact, when we do it, I'm going to be relentlessly optimistic about the next time. And I want people to be optimistic, but I want you to remember how you screwed it up and don't make that mistake again. That's all. Yeah. Pre yeah, yeah. Don't make Pre don't make the same mistakes over and over again. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's easier said than done because sure. a lot of us well, a lot of us will do look back and well, if, if I could only navigate politics, I'd be great. And it, you know, that's but I'm afraid that's uh, a human part of it that we just can't take out of it. It's impossible. Well, so, you know what? Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of work environments where it's political and we can look back and we can say, that was pretty political. If only I could do that better. And the pre-mortem allows you to go, well, what exactly was wrong about it? Well, mm -hmm. I don't know how to communicate in that political environment. I, I don't have enough clout or, you know, I tried to get people to listen to me and they wouldn't. Well, what mm -hmm. could you do differently next time to get them to take you seriously, if anything at all? Or could you just accept they're never going to listen to me? I need to find another way. Like there are all sorts of interesting questions, which is why I like the pre-mortem as a consulting exercise or something that you do <laughs> privately, because it requires you to think a little bit deeper, like, what's my role in this? What can I do a little bit differently next time? So the book takes you through that. Oh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's really awesome. Uh, looking forward to reading the rest of the book. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Florida. I'm honored yes. that you have it. Thank you. Yes, sure. Um, that is, uh, you know, you, you, we've covered a, 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 a lot. Uh, was there, was there anything else you want to assert at this time before we take off? Sure. Well, I just want people to know that, you know, executives, CEOs, CFOs, they all believe in themselves. They all bet on themselves. And what's the difference between you and a CEO? Mm -hmm. Confidence. I mean, yes, there are systemic things that may be different between you and a CEO, but ultimately CEO believes in himself. He asks for what he thinks he has coming 
Mm-hmm. And he always asks for more. He bets on himself. And I just think yeah. if more of us did that, just 1%, 2% more, imagine the things we could accomplish in this world. So that's my goal with this book, to really mm-hmm. encourage and empower people to take more and better risks. So I believe in everybody I work with. I believe in anybody who's listening or watching this mm-hmm. podcast, and I would invite them to connect with me. I would love that. Yeah, great. And people can find you, uh, Lori Ruderman, on yep. LinkedIn. And that's uh, spelled that for the people, so I don't goof it. <laughs> well, you know, they can also Google I hate HR and find me, but Ruderman is R U E T T I M A N N. But, you know, any butchering of that name, you'll eventually get to me. You'll find me. And I welcome all yeah. connections on LinkedIn. And I'm yeah. trying to be helpful. Yeah. And people can go to my connections and find you as well. Uh, so Lori Ruderman, thank you very much for joining us on the voice of job seekers and thanks everyone else for joining us. Uh, we will have a video version that will be up on the channel. You'll be able to check that out. Uh, and also if you are still, uh, struggling in a job search, you can also download my book. If you haven't already, uh, the 421 modern job search tips for 2021. Uh, gladly we've had a few thousand folks sign up for that so we're very glad that that's been useful to a lot of you in the meantime thank you very much and uh, you have a great week bye buddy